Hey everyone, it's Nico here. If you're listening to this, I'm assuming that one, you listen to podcasts, and two, you're interested in free speech issues. If so, there's a new fire-supported podcast that you have to check out. It's called Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech, and it's about, well, the history of free speech. It's hosted by Fire Visiting Fellow Jakob Mushingama, and it tracks the history of free speech from ancient Athens to today's great Chinese firewall. The people who know me well know I love history podcasts, and in 2012, I actually binged on all 179 episodes of Mike Duncan's The History of Rome podcast. And then I actually went the next step and traveled to Rome to visit the sites discussed in the podcast myself. And I must say, I have I haven't been as excited about a podcast since then. I've actually had the privilege of listening to the first few episodes of Clear and Present Danger before they're released, and I've been blown away by how comprehensively Jakob has tackled the history. It's engaging, it's insightful, and I can guarantee that even the most knowledgeable historian of free speech will learn something new. The prologue to Clear and Present Danger is available today, so check it out, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes. It's available on iTunes, Google Play, and at most places where podcasts can be found. The first official episode, which will take a look at ancient Athens and the trial of Socrates, the first official episode will be published on Thursday, February 1st, and subsequent episodes will be published every other Thursday, alternating Thursdays with so to speak. So again, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. To learn more about the podcast and to find links to its social media accounts, please visit freespeechhistory.com. Now, on to our show. Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, brought to you by FIRE the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where, as you know, every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I'm your host, Nico Perino, and today we're going to discuss one of the most important essays I've read on campus free speech issues in years. The essay appears in the winter 2018 issue of the American Prospect under the headline, The Forgotten Origins of the Constitution on Campus. It was written by Harvard Law School professor Randall Kennedy, and it addresses the crucial role that civil liberties played in the fight for racial justice on campus in the 1950s and 60s. In the piece, Professor Kennedy urges today's student activists, and the public generally, he urges them not to lose sight of how closely intertwined the rights to free speech, due process, and assembly are linked with the fight against discrimination, and how efforts to secure these rights on campus were led in no small part by those very same individuals fighting against racial injustice. Professor Kennedy encapsulates this connection quite well in the second and third paragraphs of his essay, which, if you'll indulge me a few moments, I'll read for you now, because he can say it better than I ever could. He writes, We should recall that in order to more militantly battle Jim Crow segregation, black high school and college student activists in the Deep South brought the federal constitution to campus. They initiated lawsuits that prompted judges to recognize that students at public schools are entitled to federal constitutional rights to due process and free speech. In the history of anti-racism, their demands were not atypical. Ardent champions of racial justice have typically been ardent champions of civil liberties. The second reconstruction of the 1960s, for example, prompted not only the emergence of law aimed at undoing racial hierarchy, it also prompted the growth of expansive constitutional doctrines on free expression. He continues, to protect members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People from damaging exposure by segregationalists, activists moved courts to recognize organizational privacy, to shield civil rights attorneys from rules that would have crippled their ability to further their cause through lawsuits, advocates nudged the courts to acknowledge litigation as a form of political expression warranting protection under the First Amendment, to insulate news organizations from local officials who loathed publicity that put Jim Crow customs in a bad light, 
lawyers convinced the Supreme Court to transform the law of libel and to protect civil rights protesters against hostile authorities, advocates persuaded courts to craft rules that inhibited the squelching of mass dissent. You get the idea. I invited Professor Kennedy to join me on this podcast to discuss his essay, and what follows is a deep dive into the link between civil rights and civil liberties in America. We not only discuss the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s, we also spend a lot of time talking about today's fight for free speech and racial justice on campus. We talk about the differences in language and tactics between today's activists and those of yesteryear. We also talk about where Professor Kennedy sees possible areas for concern within today's on-campus and off-campus struggles. The professor teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations at Harvard Law School. He's the author of numerous books, and prior to beginning his career as an academic, he served as a law clerk for Judge J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals and as a clerk for the Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. As I mentioned to Professor Kennedy at the end of this conversation, his essay for the American Prospect has become required reading here at FIRE. And I actually mean that literally. Our executive director, Robert Shibley, emailed the entire office and told us we had to read it. It's that important. And that's why I was so pleased that Professor Kennedy was willing to speak with me and was so generous with his time. He actually spoke with me for twice as long as he had promised to do so. We spoke this past Monday morning over the phone. And without further ado, I want to give you our conversation. Professor Randall Kennedy, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So you write in the first paragraph of your essay, The Forgotten Origins of the Constitution on Campus, you write that recent conflicts on campus have featured as antagonists proponents of racial justice on one side and proponents of civil liberties on the other side. And, and you go on to write that this is an avoidable and politically destructive strife. I'm assuming it's this strife that prompted you to write the essay. Was there any particular moment during the strife that caught your attention, or were you looking at a trend line of sorts? Well, a, a couple of things. First of all, this, uh, this political matter is one of the sources for the motivation for writing this piece. And one thing that has troubled me over the past several years, actually, is this um, pattern I've seen on my campus and on other campuses in which you have champions of racial equality being, uh, you know, sort of squaring off sometimes or feeling like they need to square off against people who view themselves primarily as champions of, um, of civil liberties. And one of the things that I wanted to point out to people is that over the course of American history, these two camps have, have usually been together. If we take a look at the 19th century, for instance, the, the people who were the strongest champions of civil liberties fighting against private forces that were seeking to muzzle people, fighting against public sources that were fighting to muzzle people. Who were those people? Those were the abolitionists. I mean, it was, it was, it was the abolitionists that really educated the American public to the need for freedom of expression more than any other group. Yeah, I think I, I we often talk on this podcast about Frederick Douglass's famous plea for free speech in Boston in, in 1860, in which a group of uh, pro-slavery rabble-rousers break up an abolitionist meeting in in Boston, and, and Frederick Douglass says during in his in his essay after the fact, you know, freedom of speech it ha also means the freedom to listen and the idea that you come to our meeting and prevent not only us from speaking, but other people from hearing our case is, is a, a violation of two rights of sorts. Yeah. Well, I mean, abolitionists over and over and over again said, let the slave power speak. We have faith in our message. In any event, it was in the 19th century, the abolitionists marched with champions of, uh, of, of, of free speech. In the 20th century, 
Again, uh, you know, if one takes a look at the second reconstruction, the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement, of course, when people think about the civil rights movement, they think immediately and rightfully of uh, progressive advances in terms of the protection of people against racial discrimination, both private and public. They think of the attack on de jure segregation. They think of the attack on private racial discrimination through, for instance, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They think of uh, the attacks on uh, racial disfranchisement through, for instance, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But one thing that people don't, you know, think about enough is how what the, the sort of the libertarian blossoming uh, that occurred, the libertarian renaissance that occurred in the Second Reconstruction, um, the you know, New York Times versus Sullivan, um, in which the news media was given uh, insulation against potentially ruinous libel judgments through a Supreme Court that wanted to, to protect news media. And what, they want, what did they want to do? They wanted to protect news media against authorities in the South that wanted to scare the news media away, scare the news media away from reporting the facts of life about the Jim Crow horrors in the South. If one thinks about um, the protection of mass dissent throughout the 1960s in cases like Edwards versus South Carolina uh, and, and others, uh, the court created doctrine to protect demonstrators against hostile local authorities. And then, to get back to my essay, one of the things that, frankly, surprised me, I, I didn't know until fairly recently, that the leading cases in which federal judges recognize uh, federal constitutional rights in student protest or in student expression or in student life generally the leading cases come from students, black students, in the Deep South who were engaged in protest. And what these students faced was uh, summary expulsions. And these students finally got lawyers, and the lawyers got the courts to say, basically, listen, students are entitled to, at the very least, um, a hearing and notice, uh, yeah, and notice and the rudiments of due process, and from there, then court started, you know, building from that and saying, well, yeah, and, and students are also entitled to, you know, First Amendment rights. So my point here is that there is no necessary conflict between champions of racial justice and champions of civil liberties. Now, you know. Or have there been times in American history in which there has been conflict? Of course. So, in the early part of the 20th century, for instance, one saw the uh, one you know the, the the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People sought to uh, suppress birth of a nation. Uh, NAACP sought to suppress what they viewed as you know a, a group vilification. Uh, so there have been tensions, and there are tensions now, and of course there will be tensions. I don't want to be a Pollyanna about it, but it's not necessary, and I think we should spend more time uh, recognizing that just as a historical matter, as a sociological matter, in my experience, you know, if you take a look at people who are strong on civil liberties usually those people are also very strong on civil rights. Well, I think one of the tensions that at least young people see today is that when they look at the courts and they look at what speech is being protected, it's often speech that seems to run contrary to concerns over social justice. Perhaps a prime example is the Westboro Baptist Church protesting outside of the funerals of dead American soldiers because of the cultural and legal shifts in America over gay marriage as, as bizarre as that sounds. Or alternatively, they see that the you know, court is protecting protests outside of abortion clinics. But these people 
sort of lose sight that the principle being defended in these cases is a neutral one and that should the pendulum swing in their direction, these same principles would be there to defend their expression and have historically protected their expression. But maybe it's not as public or happening to the same extent that it was in the 1950s and 60s. Do you think that's the case? I think that there's, uh, yes, I think that's the case. And one of the things that I think would help would, again, be just more information. So, uh, you know, when I talk with students who say, you know, exactly what you just said, I say, listen, let's, let's go back in time for a moment and let's take a look at some of the people, again, in the Second Reconstruction, in the Civil Rights Movement, these are people who were in the trenches facing white supremacy face to face who were some of the most stalwart defenders of civil liberties. You have people like Eleanor Holmes Norton, a black lawyer who worked with the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, one of her cases was a case in which she was uh, protecting the civil rights of, of all groups, the KKK because she wanted to protect civil liberties. She understood that there would come a time, as there have been throughout American history, that there would be times when it would be black groups or groups allied with the black cause that needed a, a, a strong public opinion that recognized the importance of protecting civil liberties uh, uh, freedom of expression, even when that freedom of ex- expression protected those whom you didn't like, whom you appalled, who, who appalled you, whom you really opposed in the deepest way. Or another person, my former boss, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall wrote the opinion that's credited as the leading opinion standing for the proposition that equality itself is a central requirement of a constitutional notions of freedom of expression. So, again, I think that we just, it would be helpful for people to have a longer view of history and a fuller mastery of, um, of history. I think, I think that would go a long way in, um, you know, in, in, in enlightening people and in sensitizing people to uh, the importance of freedom of expression. There are going to be times when reactionaries are going to be protected. Yes, okay. Yeah, and today they see that as Richard Spencer, as Milo Yiannopoulos, as uh, some conservative commentators like Ben Shapiro and Ann Coulter, but it was their side 40 years ago. Absolutely, and by the way, and by the way, we don't have to go back 40 years. The fact of the matter is that you don't have to scratch far to see uh, efforts to squelch, um, you know, multiculturalist opinion, progressive opinion. I mean, you think about it. Uh, it's it's very dis- it's very disturbing to see the alacrity with which people are willing to um, use force to silence you know those who they don't like. Whether it's people who are kneeling down mm-hmm. uh, at football games, whether it's people who don't want to salute the flag, whether it's people who want to uh, voice opposition to the political status quo, you know, again, you know, progr- at this moment, in particular in American history, when we see the most troubling signs of authoritarianism or sort of authoritarian habits coming to the fore, now we really have to have our antenna up to respecting civil liberties, to respecting one of the really the great things about our society, which is um, our um, our openness, uh, our willingness to you know let pluralism bloom. It's not perfect, of course, but if one takes a look around the world, one can say that this is one of the things that makes American society actually uh, you know quite attractive. When we look at the 1950s and 60s, 
and phrases such as civil liberties, civil rights, racial justice, social justice. Was there ever a distinction then between these civil rights or these civil liberties to freedom of speech and due process and assembly and, you know, the the closely held civil rights, um, you know, when you think about racial justice, or is that a distinction that has more come into being in recent years? No, you know, there's a wonderful article about just this very issue written by a guy named Christopher Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. It's called The Civil Rights-Civil Liberties Divide. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's 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 available um you know or online so it's it's a very nice piece and he really he he follows the history of the term civil liberties as distinct from civil rights uh i'll leave it to him to you know go through the history he writes a very good article about this i think nowadays when people think of civil rights, they think of protections against discrimination. Usually they think of protections against racial discrimination, though it's gotten a little bit broader, of course. People think about uh, sexual orientation, think about gender, think about disabilities. But it's usually, you know, civil rights is usually connotes um, protections against some sort of unfair discrimination, whereas civil liberties typically connotes protections against governmental overreaching. Interestingly enough, I'd say recently both have become broadened. So when, you, when, th- when people think about civil rights today, they, they often think about protections against both public and uh, private bias. And when people think about civil liberties, whereas a, you know, an older notion would have been protection against governmental overreaching, I think nowadays when people say, talk about civil liberties, they're starting to think more and more about both private overreaching and public overreaching. So both of these terms are terms that I think have been broad uh, recently. Is there a skepticism of either one of these terms? Today, do you see a greater skepticism of not just freedom of speech, but of other civil liberties like due process amongst today's advocates for racial justice or social justice? I recall that you uh, signed on to the letter at Harvard um, discussing some of the due process concerns. I believe it was the due process concerns related to a, um, an issue of sexual assault at Harvard, and it resulted in your being protested at Occidental. Yes. Uh, Two things. Number one, yeah, again, I think that we need more public education. We need to recognize that a lot of struggle has gone into claiming basic, fundamental, rudimentary rights, notice, hearing, presumption of innocence, These things didn't just fall from the air. People had to struggle for this, and we oughtn't surrender these things easily. And we ought to recognize that these are fundamental protections, and we ought to, you know, jealously guard them. So that's one thing. Second thing, you mentioned protest. That's right, I was protested. You know, I thought that the people who were protesting me were, were you know, just mistaken. But one thing I want to say uh, ab- ab- about this is the people who were protesting me, you know, they were using their civil liberties, too. Yeah. They had every right to protest me, and that's fine. I think that they were incorrect. I went out there. I debated them. But I don't think that it's a wrong thing for people to use their voices to, you know, push their political agenda. Fine. That's exactly what people should do. And I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that, you know, sometimes I think people are wrong. I think they're incorrect. And so I will debate them, but I'm not going to attempt to shut them down. Yeah. We, we at FIRE find ourselves in a tough position in recent years because on the one hand, you have 
students protesting. They're protesting racial injustice on campus, and that's protected speech, and we would go to the mat to defend them. But while doing that, some students are also protesting in support of speech codes or protesting in support of fewer due process rights for students accused of misconduct on campus. And that's also protected speech. But it's protected speech that we disagree with fundamentally. And while we would still protect them if they were ever punished for exercising their rights and protesting free speech or due process, we at the same time have to push back on this normative concern, on this cultural idea that these things are bad and should be restricted in this manner or or another. And I I look and also see a sort of, I don't want to use the word hypocrisy, but it is almost a hypocrisy on the due process front because we have a great awakening at the moment surrounding criminal justice reform. And at the same time, you have calls for making it easier for people to be accused and convicted or found responsible for campus crimes. It's as though the principles that we find important in the criminal justice system are no longer important when you see these principles violated in other systems. And of course, on campus, there's no life or liberty at stake. But in some cases, it could affect your ability to find a job. It could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're expelled from a university in which you've already paid your tuition. It could mean you don't get security clearances for jobs. It could mean you're branded this, that, or the other thing. So there's this cultural appreciation and there's this legal appreciation. And it feels to me as though the cultural appreciation is diminishing. And that seems to be what your concern is as well when you talk about education. Yeah, a a couple things, a couple reactions to what you just said. One... I think that we have made some strides in pointing out that we really live in a hyper-punitive culture. That's one of the more unattractive features of our culture. We are just too punitive. So, you know, um, we talk about mass incarceration, and I'm glad that there's been uh, this focus on mass incarceration. We we over-punish and we therefore raise the misery index in our mm-hmm. society, and we ought to be against that. And I would say similarly, you know, let's keep that in mind so that if we're talking about people who are doing things that we don't like, you know, doing, you know, and it could be criminal things included, let's say criminal things. Obviously, we need, we need protection. Obviously, we need deterrence. But for goodness sakes, let's remember the misery, the gratuitous misery that has been caused by our hyper-punitiveness, and we need to keep that in check. Now, earlier, you, you talked about codes. One of the things that concerns me about the discussion of civil liberties, civil rights on campus is... I think we lose track sometimes of the overall context. So we'll read an article that will begin by giving, you know, 10 instances of horrible racial epithets being hurled at people of color or sexist statements, sexist gestures. Mm -hmm. You know, 10, let's say 15. Now, I read that. I think that that's, you know, that's, that's important to keep into account, to take into account. At the same time, it's also important to take into account how many universities there are in the United States. Yeah, over 4,000. There are yeah. thousands. It's important to take into account how many students there are in the United States. Hundreds of thousands. Now, in a, in a society this large, in a place, you know, with, with you know, so many students, one has to take into account, well, you know, it, 10 examples, 20 examples, frankly, 50 examples. Is this characteristic? Is this an outlier? We need to be, I think, a lot more attentive. And by the way, I would say that on the flip side as well. So, for instance, um, it's, you know, if, if you point out examples of people um, 
uh, wanting to shout down speakers on a college campus. You know, I, bad. But for goodness sakes, and you can give me an example, you know, Middlebury College or this college or that mm-hmm. college. But again, we have to be attentive. There are lots of colleges in the United States. What's characteristic? What's an outlier? We need to work harder, I think, at keeping everything in perspective. Well, one of the the differences amongst many of these colleges is that most of them are two-year commuter schools. They're community colleges, they're junior colleges um, with a mix of traditional and non-traditional students who don't have the same sort of campus life that, for example, a Harvard or a Yale or many of these bigger state schools will have. So you don't have the same robust protest culture. So it's less likely that you would see some of these incidents occurring there, although we have seen many incidents occur on community college campuses or junior college campuses. Most recently, we filed a lawsuit on behalf of a socialist student um, handing out stop capitalism flyers in protest of a conservative student group. And she was detained by the police for 40 minutes and said, and said, and and told by the police, you have free speech, but it needs to get approved by us first. Uh, so we, of course, filed a, a lawsuit there. But that, that sort of case doesn't get the attention that a uh, heckler, for example, at Harvard might, not just because it's a community college, but also because Harvard is Harvard and Yale is Yale. You've been in, on a campus for a very long time. Uh, you've worked in, in higher education longer than I have. Have you seen a change in the culture, even if it's not examples like an Allison Stringer at Middlebury getting whiplash and having to be put in a brace because she wanted to interview Charles Murray's, but like a cultural chilling effect as a result of maybe even just the discussion of some of these issues or the concerns in the language that's being used? I have been surprised. I have, because I, I, I must say, Sometimes I have been skeptical at the claims, for instance, that your organization has voiced. Sometimes I've thought that you all have overdone it, that you have, you know, depicted the campuses as more uh, censorious than they are. Um, At the same time, there have been events that I have seen in which, you know, people have try to shut things down. And then actually more interesting to me or more telling to me than the actual efforts to shut things down is what occurs afterwards. I mean, frankly, more chilling to me sometimes has been the defenses of the people who have shut things down. Because you know, it doesn't take that many people to shut things down, to tell you the truth. And it could be that you just simply have a few hotheads. Mm-hmm. But then there'll be the debate afterwards, and there will be people who will be defending this. And it's at that point that I say, whoa, because now people are being deliberative. They think they've had a chance to think about it. And even if after they've had a chance to think about it, they are defending a truncation of public discourse in a circumstance in which it really is unjustified and, uh, you know, uh, and unjustifiable. And, you know, that to me is a problem. Here's a thing that I've been preaching to students on my campus that I, I don't think has gotten the traction that I would like to see it get. So, for instance, on my campus, here at Harvard Law School, over the, over the past, let's say, 10 or 15 years, from time to time, there will be some event, there will be some episode in which somebody will say something that is deemed to be you know, racially discriminatory, racist, and students will, you know, will come and say, gosh, we ought, you know, the, the, the administration ought to do something about this. Don't you think that, Professor Kennedy? And my response to them will be, listen, you guys are ceding your power to the authorities. You students actually have much more power than you think that you have. Mm-hmm. Why, is it, why in the world do you want to sort of call, you know, uh, Big Daddy or Big Mama, the <laughs> dean or the president, 
what, what what are you are you seeking to go back to make the school authorities your parents for goodness sake what you want to do is take your power and use it so there's nothing like public opinion if a student has said something that you think is really quite offensive what you ought to do as far as i'm concerned is write an open letter in which you first detail what has happened from your perspective you voice your objection publicly transparently you voice your objection and you give the student a chance number one is this what happened again notice you know maybe you're mm-hmm. viewing it wrongly you know is this what happened if this is what happened we object to it and we demand that you apologize and you tell them listen and if you don't apologize we are going to turn to our fellow students and we are going to tell our fellow students that we think that public opinion should be arrayed against you. To tell you the truth, that is a very powerful weapon. That is a very powerful weapon of discipline. And I think it's open, it's transparent, and it's big mama and big daddy out of it. It's a student thing. I think that you could accomplish a lot doing that. But, but is there a generational divide there? So I was struck a while back by a paper written by two sociologists, Bradley Campbell and Jason Mannion, which talked about various mor- moral cultures in recent centuries. Um, for example, there was a period in which we had an honor culture where people must earn honor and and therefore avenge insults on their own. We think of the the duels that Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr had, for example, where they were avenging their honor. And then during the civil rights era, you seem to have this culture of dignity in which people assumed that their dignity was inherent and that it wasn't dependent on the perception of anyone else and and they didn't need to earn it because it was part of who they were as a person. And, And then you have today what seems to be a culture of victimhood. And I don't love the word victimhood, but it seems as though people are being encouraged to respond to even the slightest unintentional offenses as an affliction on their honor, almost a return to the honor culture, but that honor must be avenged not by themselves, but an appeal almost to a third party, an administrative body, if we're talking about college campuses. And there seems to be a sense that their dignity isn't inherent, or at least they don't seem to feel it's as inherent as maybe the civil rights leaders of the 1950s and 60s did? I don't know. One of the things that is concerning me is that the rules and regulations and habits that we design for ourselves actually shapes our habits, shapes our self-perceptions, shapes our strengths, and our weaknesses. Now, you know, if, if we get in the habit of saying, you know, I feel traumatized, I feel hurt, I am hurt, um, what is that doing to us? I mean, one of the things that I say to my students, especially the progressive students who view themselves as people who, you know, they, they, they want to go out in the, in the world and change the world for the better, and I'm with them. I tell them I'm with you, and I say to them, to change the world for the better, you have to be tough. The world is tough. It is difficult to move the world in a good direction, even a millimeter. And to have that toughness, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to just you know somebody says something and and, and what and you're gonna say oh this is hurt this is this is penetrated to the quick of me mm-hmm. this is drawn psychic blood from me how are you gonna be my champion how are you gonna change the world if you can be hurt that easily if you could be traumatized that easily no. You should laugh. You should laugh. You should say, what? You think that that's going to hurt me? You should laugh and march on. And here, you know, again, think about what 
you know, I'm, one of the reasons why I keep going back to the second reconstruction is I'm writing a book about the civil rights era. And one of the things that I love about the book, and one of the reasons I like, I'm, I love actually writing it, is because it forces me to encounter so many inspiring people. I want to say to students, what? You think that John Lewis was hurt to the quick and was traumatized when people called him nigger? That was what, what are you talking about? That was a light day for him. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you've, you've, you've got to be strong, and to be strong, let people talk. Let people throw things your way. Toughen up and march on. And I think if you do that, you will create within yourself a stronger self. A, you know, a, a, more, a, a, a stronger self which will allow you to do those things which will need to be done to you know, move our society up uh, to a, you know, a higher level. So one of the things, I, the, the long and the short of it is one of the things I, I, I guess I don't like about, uh, you know, one of, you know this, this sort of, um, you know, frankly, sometimes crybabyism. Uh, you know, I'm hurt, I'm traumatized, forget that. Are you kidding? Look at the world. Every day there are hurtful terrible atrocities going on all over the world. You are going to have to, uh, you're going to have to proceed in the face of that. And to proceed in the face of that, you're going to have to create for yourself a way of being that is tough. And you cannot be tough, it seems to me, if we're in the habit of constantly saying to people, well, we know you're traumatized. We know your feelings are hurt. You know, what can we do so that you don't have to have hurt feelings? I don't think that that is a good thing for, I don't think that's a good, uh, those, those are not good habits for social reformers uh, to inculcate. Yeah, or for even mental health. Uh, a lot of what you're saying there reminds me of some ancient wisdom. Uh, the Buddha said, and I'm paraphrasing here, refuse to be hurt and you have not been hurt. Uh, Shakespeare and Hamlet. Stoics. Yeah, the Stoics. And, and Hamlet says there's no nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. How you internalize and interpret the world and, you know, in its essence, say to yourself how you want to be can result in you being that way, can result in you not being hurt. But one thing I wanted to ask you about, as someone who speaks on campus often, you pointed, you, you tipped your hat to some of the common arguments that we hear against freedom of speech and other civil liberties today. The idea that people like Milo Yiannopoulos or Richard Spencer come to campus and one of the common phrases we hear is they deny my right to it, my humanity. And therefore, my shutting them down, my, in some cases, rioting, as we saw at Berkeley, is self-defense. After, after the Berkeley riots on February 1st of last year that caused $100,000 in damage and, and shut down Miley Yiannopoulos' speech, the Daily Californian, which is the student newspaper at Berkeley, ran a symposium of sorts on their op-ed pages um, under the title Violence as Self-Defense, in which a number of students came out and said what Milo Yiannopoulos said was going to say would be traumatizing to us it would afflict emotional injury um it's often conflated with a sort of physical injury and that our speaking up our protesting our rioting the presence of black box block therefore is just self-defense how do you respond to that because when i go to campus i have a hard time doing it because they say that i don't take their emotions seriously that i am leaving them vulnerable to both phys physical and emotional injury, and then when I when I try and investigate the claims in a you know a Socratic method, I, I get dismissed as uh, speaking from a place of privilege. So how do you respond? I respond by saying a couple of things. Number one, I respond by saying the people that you just mentioned uh, have actually benefited tremendously from 
these um, riotous responses that they've gotten. I simply do not understand uh, how the adversaries of some of these racists, I do not understand how they can't see that they have benefited. Just take a look. You know, take a look at the speaking fees. Take a look at the pop. You know, take a look at the number of invitations. Take a look at the publicity that some of these people have received. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just just at, at a tactical level, it seems to me self defeating. This fellow Milo, I, and I can't pronounce his last. Yeanopolis, and you're right. His book rose to number one on Amazon the day after the riots. The day after the riot, I saw him on Fox News. The guy was grinning ear to ear. He loved it. He loved the attention. I mean, frankly, any time, you know, I mean, what? So people ought to remember, people ought to remember that in these struggles, there is always a very large number of people who are observers. I mean, frankly, there's a relatively small number of people who come to any of these events. Even the biggest of these events really draw a fairly small number of people. A much larger number of people are people who are observing. They're not watching this stuff day to day to day, moment to moment. They're just sort of observing. And then they see this guy come and You know, people riot, and then people say, well, whoa, what is this guy saying that requires a riot in response? I mean, that's just the most natural thing for people to think. So at the strategic level, I don't like it. Another thing I say is, listen, let's really be careful. Let's be careful. It would be one thing. It would be one thing if you told me that there were, you know, a hundred thousand Nazis marching down the road. If you told me that and that was true, well, you would certainly have my attention, and I think we would be having a somewhat different conversation. That's not the way it is. The fact of the matter is, and and again, I, you know, I, I think I'm I'm alarmed by various tendencies in our society, but fortunately, we are not confronting a hundred thousand Nazis you know, walking down the road. We, these people, frankly, are on the margins, and I think that the way in which the people at Berkeley, the, you know, uh, you know by, by rioting, actually, we exaggerated the power of these, you know, people, these extreme right-wing people. We exaggerated their power. We fed them. We gave them a prominence that they ought not to have had. My, re- I, so I think just at the level of strategy, it just uh, there's there's not a good payoff. It has been very helpful to them. It's very helpful to them to be able to portray the progressive forces in the society as the ones who want to shut down freedom of speech. Fortunately, in the United States, freedom of speech is something that you know, really has prestige. And so if you're trying to shut that down, there are a lot of people who just, you know, might not know a whole lot, but if you're trying to shut down freedom of speech, a lot of people are going to be instinctively against you. So I would say you better be very careful if you're on the bad side of the freedom of speech line. And again, you know, yes, I talk with people all the time, you know, My feelings are going to be hurt by, you know, Milo. My feelings are going to be hurt by this one or that one. And I say to them, listen, let these people speak. Uh, Let them discredit themselves. Can you do other things? It's not like I'm saying be complacent. No, we can't be complacent. Don't be complacent. But can't you, you can hold a counter rally. You could, you could appeal to your fellow students, appeal to your fellow students. Let's ostracize these people. Let's let these people talk to a half full auditorium. Let's have a counter rally, a counter demonstration in which we talk about the sort of things 
that we want to talk about. There are other ways of handling this other than trying to, you know, shout down or suppress these, uh, these people. And there, there's, a, there's another thing. There's another thing as well, and that is we always have to be attentive to the foibles of human nature. You know, it's, it's uh, the people who engaged in the riot, you know, I think that some of them, I would say, you know, I disagree with them, but I think that, you know, some of them probably were authentically, you know, anti-fascist. Okay, I disagree with them strongly, but, you know, fine, they were authentically anti-fascist. Listen, some of these people are just yeah. people who, you know, they want to riot. <laughs> they, 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 you know, they, they are... They want to do something. They, they, they want to act out. They want to be on stage. And I think we have to be very careful about that. Just because somebody says that they are uh, an anti-racist activist, you know, uh, you know, we have to look beneath that sometimes and say, you know, and, and, and be attentive to, you know, again, the foibles of human nature. Some people, some of the time, are just, you know, acting out. They don't really care about the consequences of what they do. And that should be a problem. That is a problem for people who, again, want to organize dissent and for the purpose of making ours a better society. See, a lot of the arguments you're making are ones that we at FIRE make when we go to campus. Um, but some of us, we go to campus, and again, we're, se- we're told we're speaking from a place of privilege because, uh, you know, some of us are white, uh, some of us aren't LGBTQ, uh, some of us are male. Do you see a movement towards a sort of soft resegregation in our in our public dialogue the the idea that you need to have a certain identity in order to speak and you see this in other places with affinity dorms concerns over cultural appropriation you can't write a fictional story about someone who's uh different than you there's also you know opposition to interracial adoption which i know you've been involved in what are your thoughts on that it's a it's it's a real problem in the classroom it comes out like this we'll be having a discussion and a student will begin uh, his or her statement with um, speaking as a and then blank. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it'll be a white person who will start off with a self-deprecating reference to their whiteness as a way of basically saying to the audience, saying to the classmates, you know, listen, I know I'm white, uh, discount what I'm about to say, and then they go on and make their statement. And what I frequently say when I hear this is, you know, first of all, let's knock it off. What did, you know, your parenthetical speaking as a blank have to do with what came afterwards? Either what came afterwards was worthy or it was not. Now, you know, just go on and say what you've got to say. And then after you've said what you've got to say, let's let everybody have at it. You know, either it's worthwhile or it's not. The question of, you know, what your skin color is, the question of where you come from, the question of your parents, uh, you know, socioeconomic status, you know, let's, let's, Let's just let that stuff drop. Let's stick to let's stick let's stick to substance. So yes, the problem that you are talking about is a real problem. Um, I think, frankly, that again, one of the reasons why to go back to my you know point of departure, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this article nowadays, over and over and over, when you read about. Freedom of you know struggles over freedom of expression on campus. It begins with Berkeley and the free speech movement. Now, first of all, one thing that people don't know is that Mario Savio and some of the other leaders of the free speech movement. Where did they find their voices 
Where did Mario Savio find his voice? He found his voice. This, this white young man found his voice in the Deep South. Yes, he did. He came back to Northern California, transformed by his experience fighting anti-black racism, and he found his voice. And that happened with a lot of white people. That was one of the glories of the Second Reconstruction. People ought to remember that. People ought to remember, like I said, if you think about champions of freedom of expression within you know, black communities, Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall's great teacher, a strong civil libertarian, a very strong civil libertarian, Thurgood Marshall, strong civil libertarian. If one takes a look at the briefs of the, uh, 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 the lawyers fighting on behalf of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, fighting on behalf of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, fighting on behalf of the Black Panther Party, one will see these people articulating the very notions of, you know, civil liberties, freedom of expression. Due process. Due process. Skepticism towards governmental intervention. Skepticism and opposition towards overreaching of all sorts. It's, it's, you know, because they saw what, it ha- what happened when, when there was overreach, when there was intervention, yes. Absolutely. People ought to remember, again, you know, people, people ought to remember that not so long ago, there was a concerted effort to silence Martin Luther King Jr., to silence others. Uh, you know, civil rights leaders, and that's one of the reasons why they were so attentive to civil liberties. It, Martin Luther King Jr.'s first speech as a civil rights leader was at the very beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. And in that great speech, extemporaneous speech he made, he talked about the great glory of American democracy being the right to protest. In his last speech, he said the same thing. Mm. And so, you know, again, folks ought to remember these things as we try to grapple with, uh, you know, our own current challenges, dilemmas and our own challenges. And as for, you know, the privilege, I mean, you know, I'm black. And so, you know, when I, I, I don't, I don't get as much of that, but I get a little bit of it. I get a little bit of it. I mean, I remember, uh, I wrote something, there was an, there was something that happened here at Harvard a couple of years ago, Harvard Law School, and I wrote something in the New York Times, and there were a couple of people who wrote back and said, well, you know, you're speaking as a, you know, a privileged, you know, a privileged law professor, and, you know, you're, you're, you're going to encounter that. And I, I guess what I would say is you have to proceed anyway. We have to be careful about mao mowing you know, <laughs> Mao-mowing no, mao, mao, mao happened. Yeah. mao mowing happened. It happened back then. You know, it happened back then. A sort of a type of, you know, an effort to, an effort to uh, you know, shame white people and, you know, white progressives, you know, shaming them, shutting them down, shutting them, you know, you know, trying to silence them, trying to inhibit them. And, um, you know, if, if somebody would, you know, and, and that's going to happen. There is going to be a certain a type of mao mowing And I think that, that, you know, that's just comes with the territory. And I think that you simply have to be straightforward and say, as clearly as you can, what you believe. And by the way, this does not mean, and I'm talking to you directly right now, I'm talking to FIRE directly right now, it doesn't mean that we are all going to agree on everything. We are going to have our disagreements. I'm going to disagree with FIRE about certain things, I suppose. I'm just, <laughs> and we'd love to hear them. I'm sure. It'll make us better. You know, but 
disagreement is one thing. Um, dis- disagreement is part of learning. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, when you criticize, I- I've had this. You know, I cri- if, if if I criticize somebody who is let's say making an argument for speech codes and you know and I don't I don't like the speech code business again I think that the whole effort to create speech codes on campus was destructive for you know my political camp I count myself in the progressive political camp that's where I put my, that's where I am and I think that the speech codes were actually quite harmful. It made my political camp look like it was, you know, sort of anti-free speech, uh, skeptical of free speech, scared of free speech. And, you know, for what? These speech codes are so... T- First of all, all of them have been struck down in which there's been litigation. Yep. And even if they weren't struck down, forget about them being struck down. Even if they existed, they, you know, they cover so little that they weren't worth the candle. The fact of the matter is, in, you know, in our law, we have protections against somebody coming up in my face and making racially motivated threats against me. I mean, already, forget about a code. You know, people can't do that. You know, that's intimidation. That's assault. If it's repeated, it's harassment. It's harassment. There are all, yeah. you know, it's, it's, not as if, it's not as if the society is stupid. We've got protection. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't need to have that. And I think that the very effort that went into creating these things, it, it was a public relations disaster as far as I'm concerned. And... But, you know, when I talk with people about that, okay, I'm saying that, you know, you disagree with me. That's okay. Disagreement is part of learning. And uh, it shouldn't be viewed as something bad. It shouldn't be viewed as a betrayal. It shouldn't be viewed, some, you know, sometimes I've heard people say, you know, um, Kennedy, you're attacking us. No, I'm not attacking you. Yeah, it's the language of physical violence almost, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, what do you mean attacking you? I'm criticizing you. you. Listen to what I have to say and then, you know. Respond. Respond. And mm-hmm. frankly, maybe your response, you know, maybe your response will make me say, you know what, you've got a good point. Let me revise what I said a few minutes ago. We need to we need to discuss without discussion without criticism we will not be able to learn from one another and that's what we need to do. Yeah, and if you're concerned, I mean, to respond to a couple of the points that you that you're making, if if we're concerned about the state of our institutions, whether on campus or on off campus, the idea that you would give those very same institutions that wield so much power and engage in unjust actions the power to censor those people who are criticizing those institutions through speech code seems tactically unsound to me. Here's Uh, another thing. Here's another thing about our current moment that I find to be very important. I have my disagreements with various educational institutions. I think that, uh, you know, some of these, some of the institutions have, uh, you know, not been attentive enough to the requirements and the challenges and the, the mandates of, you know, open expression. I, I, I think mm-hmm. that, and, you know, so, okay. I also think that we need to be very attentive to the fragility and the preciousness of our institutions of higher education. And when people start making comments about, you know, shut it down or making it seem as though these institutions are centers of oppression because they're not being attentive enough to, you know, marginalize people, to me, again, I think to myself, are you what are you talking about? 
The fact of the matter is we need these institutions of higher education. There are no institutions in American life that are in principle and by aspiration more attentive to the life of the mind and all that that entails than are institutions of higher education. So we need to be protective of them. One way to be protective of them is to call them out when they are themselves engaging in self-destructive behavior. But we need to do all of that with a, I think, a certain, you know, with, with an awareness of how important these institutions are to the functioning of a good, pluralistic, uh, inclusive, um, you know, democracy. Well, and and we've gone a little bit over our time. Do you have an extra five minutes here? For yeah, Professor sure. I'm, I'm having a fun time. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you say there we, on the one hand, we need to keep these institutions honest and we need to ensure that they're pursuing their mission of the mind. But on the other hand, we need to be careful not to at the same time destroy these institutions because they're, they're precious. But isn't that kind of what some of the presidents of these black universities were doing in the 1950s and sixties when they were in, in essence censoring their students or denying them due process, they were doing it at the behest of these white governors or these white trustees. And you actually talk about this tension in your article and you're empathetic to it. You say they were in an impossible position because if they didn't kowtow to the demands of the governor or to the, the white trustees, then they could lose funding and you could lose the pursuit that, a, that an academic institution is, is supposed to be doing. But at the same time, they're, they're throwing some of their students under their bus, denying them basic civil liberties. So it is a, t- I mean, it's a, it's the same sort of tension today that we saw then. Yes, and it's a it's a real dilemma, and it calls for judgment. So, for instance, you know, uh, it, I I still stick by the proposition that institutions of higher education are, you know, extremely valuable. That does not mean, however, that I would be against suing them if necessary in order to prompt them to live up to their highest, you know, aspirations. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, litigation is itself a sort of criticism, uh, or propaganda is a sort of criticism, too. Um, you know, an op-ed piece of criticizing a university. Again, it's not an attack on the university. It's, it can be a call for the university to, uh, you know, to embrace its, its, its highest principles. And, and censorship is, is destructive of that, not just insofar as it restricts the ideas on campus, the marketplace of ideas, that is. But we see saw in a recent Pew poll that over 50% of conservatives believe that higher education is detrimental to society at large, to the country at large. And there's a sense that censorship itself, censorship of conservatives, has resulted in that feeling. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, 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 I will say this. I'm very impatient with the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal when in episode after episode after episode when they're talking about political correctness they see you know they 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 focus on progressives you know at Middlebury College or other places at Berkeley or whatever places acting in ways that you know with which I disagree but what I want to say to the Wall Street Journal is, you know, um, I did not see you uh, criticizing the Congress of the United States when it threatened to withhold funding from the Smithsonian Institution, when the Smithsonian Institution, as part of its public education, wanted to, let's say, uh, have a public exhibition about the Enola Gay and the bombing of Japan or any other. I think that we have to be very attentive to the, the politics of this. I think just like, I think we, I think that there is a, you know, there has been a very powerful 
um, conservative opportunism, which doesn't see it's overreaching. It only sees overreaching on the other side. I think we need to be very attentive to that. This is why it's so important that we don't let civil liberties become a partisan issue. I was hosting a panel at New York University recently in which Mark Lilla sat, and he's a progressive professor at Columbia, recently wrote the book, uh, The Once and Future Liberal. And on that panel, he said, don't cede the civil liberties free speech on campus ground to Fox News, MSNBC. I would call on you to be the first ones out there when you see an abridgment of freedom of speech or due process and to call those universities for the task. Otherwise, you cede this ground to conservatives, to Fox News, to the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. And the same goes for Fox. If you don't want to see your people censored on on campus, go out there and defend that right for everyone. You know, um, I've, I've wanted to deliver a message to the people on MSNBC, and now that I have a camera, I will. <laughs> uh, to Chris, and Chris, and Rachel, and Lawrence, and Brian. The, at the moment you see that there's been an attack on free speech on campus, be the first to report it. Do not wait for Fox News to do that and to exploit it for their own ends. The people who should be most upset about what is happening on our campuses are people who care about liberal prospects in this country politically. And every time one of these, event, one of these incidents happen, it's another nail in the coffin. And it's your job to speak up first. You know where to reach me. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that, I mean, Lilla, you know, it's funny, you, you called him progressive. Uh, you know, many of my friends see him as, you know, uh, the enemy. I don't understand why they see him as the enemy. I, actually, I do understand. I just disagree with them. They would probably call him a neoliberal, which is a way of... <laughs> the various things. The point is, he's making a very strong point. And I, 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 again, I, I tried to make it earlier when I said it's a mistake. Again, in American society, and you know, listen, I'm very critical about our society. I really, I think that our society bears the scars of injustice and cruelty of, you know, a wide array of dimensions, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about class, whether we're talking about sexual orientation, you know, I think there's much, much, much wrong with our society. One thing, however, about the course of the 20th century is that various people, through tremendous struggle, I think of the American Civil Liberties Union, I think of your organization, I think of other organizations. One thing that, has, that civil libertarians have been pretty successful in doing is raising the prestige of the notion of freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. That, it seems to me, is a very good thing. If you are against freedom of expression... There are a lot of people, they might not know about the particular, you know, the particular struggle. They might know, not know about the particulars, but their antenna go way up if they get the impression that you're trying to shut things down. They don't like that. And I think that that is a good impulse in American life, and I think that it should be protected. And I think that it needs to be, it really needs to be nurtured because frankly, you know, we can talk about courts all we want to. I'm a lawyer. Um, you know, the way I pay my mortgage is by teaching people the ins and outs of legal doctrine. I think that legal doctrine is important. I think that courts are important, but there's something that's more important than legal doctrine and more important than courts, and that is public opinion because ultimately, Legal doctrine and courts will change if public opinion changes. And that's why, apart from, you know, whatever happens in court, I say over and over again, 
talk to your neighbors, make the appeal to public opinion. And one of the things we've got to do is we have to steal public opinion so that it, we have to reinforce this, the public opinion so that it continues to view freedom of expression as something that is good. We have to, we have to, you know, we really do have to reinforce that idea as the default position. If that means saying, you know, listen, Milo is coming to town and wants to talk. You know, I, again, I have no truck with what he says. Let him talk. Because we want to get the society in the habit of letting people talk. Yeah, that's Justice Learned Han, a former Second Circuit judge, of course, said in a famous speech, when liberty dies in the hearts of men, there's no court, there's no law that can that can save it. And the, the story of the 20th century, and we've covered this on the podcast extensively, is one of increasing protection for speech led by mostly progressive lawyers. Uh, and and ju- and judges, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, is famous to send Abrams, the United States, Louis Brandeis, um, Arye Nyer, the executive director of the ACLU during the Skokie case, Ira Glasser, who took over from him. Um, all these lawyers set the First Amendment where it is today, where it has this expansive protection of speech through fights over progressive dissent from World War One, uh, through fights against uh, McCarthy and. Uh, crackdowns on communist sympathies, the civil rights movement, as you write about in the forgotten origins of the constitution on campus, Vietnam. I mean, it's only recently where the pendulum has sort of swung and progressives are more concerned about the emotional trauma that might be caused by speech and are, are, are seeding the ground on the protections for that speech. I think that I, I, I think that that description is largely correct and fortunately, fortunately, um, you know, we're in the middle of things. We are in a situation where we're in the middle of things. I think that that can be changed. I think that it will be very important to sound the, the, the alarm about the dangers of authoritarianism. I mean, again, you know, you give the state the power to shut up this one, that one, and the other one. And the state in this case would be the Trump administration, and if you're a progressive, many Republican-led state legislatures. Yeah. Well, I would say, you know, I, I, I have Trump in mind, but frankly, a more general proposition, and we've seen it over and over and over, it might look like you know, you might not be worried about who's being shut up today because it's not your folks, but, you know, next week is going to come, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and we've just seen it over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah, wasn't it Ruth Bader Ginsburg who said uh, America, if anything, is a pendulum when it swings far one way, it always has this tendency to swing back the other, which I think is, is a good story of America. It will, and we've seen the, you know, the, 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 the case of censorship. You know, it's not like, um, you know, I wrote, a, I, wrote a, I wrote a book a number of years ago, Nigger, the Strange Career of a Troublesome Word, and, you know, encountered a lot of difficulty with it. I'd say that probably once a year, I find myself writing a letter to some place um, uh, in defense of a teacher who has been dismissed for Xeroxing part of my book and giving it out to the class. This happens, you know, this happens, fortunately, not a whole lot. And are they getting, um, they're not getting disciplined for copyright concerns, I'm assuming. They're getting, getting disciplined for the title. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. I have never complained. It probably is a copyright infringement, but you know, I, I love it. I, you know, the reason I write is for people to read, so I don't, you know, I don't care about that. But my point is, and it's a real serious point. So you'll have people who, one of the things I've mentioned in that book, 
is that Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., there came a point in Washington, D.C., where the authorities there passed a, uh, passed, had enacted a policy saying that any publication that printed the infamous N-word would be immediately banned from a school. Do you know what was the first publication banned? I'm, I'm assuming it was the book by Dick Gregory. No, even <laughs> before then. It was the Crisis Magazine, the magazine of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored oh, People. Oh, wow. Because in one of its editorials, it was talking about the N-word being used as a weapon against black people. And so it was, you know, it was just detailing things. Mm -hmm. That book... Uh, of course, Dick Gregory's book has been banned. James Baldwin has been banned. Toni Morrison has been banned. I mean, you know, this is the way that things work. And again, people ought to be attentive to the problem with banning, the problem with prohibition, the problem with silencing this is the sort of thing that happens, and we need to be attentive to it. What we should want is a citizenry, a populace that is educated, that is strong, that can listen to various things and not be traumatized, not be silenced, not be hurt. Uh, we, should have, we should want to have a set of habits a set of laws, a set of protocols that inculcates that inner strength so that people can listen to everything, you know, listen to mm -hmm. everything, and then reach the conclusion that they think best. That is what we should want. And when we, when we take shortcuts, when we allow the authorities to, you know, um, you know, to keep things from us, sometimes with the belief that actually they're, you know, saving us or, you know, or, or keeping us from a hurt. They're not keeping us from hurt. They might think that they're keeping us from hurt. Maybe they authentically think that they're keeping us from hurt, but actually they are hurting us. They are preventing us from using the opportunity presented to strengthen ourselves. We, how can we be strong if we don't know what's out in the world? We, know, we need to know what's out in the world. And by the way, I want to go back to an earlier thing you said. You know, when you go to campuses and, you, you know, when students say that, gosh, if you allow so-and-so to speak, it's going to hurt our feelings. Now, again, these are smart students. These are, you know, these are people. I, 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 I sympathize with the students, but what I want, what I say to them is, you know, listen, it's not easy, actually, to confront the people who you view as your enemies. It's not as if you are going to be able to effectively confront them without learning how to confront them. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, this guy, this guy, I've seen this, you know, some of these people, they are actually very practiced and very good debaters. They really are. Um, you know, you get in front of a crowd, you, you know, you, it's not as if, even if they're, what they're saying is, you know, you know is terrible, debating is itself a skill. You can't get in front of one of these people in front of a crowd and just think that you were going to win over the crowd just because your ideas are superior. No. What you've got to do, you've got to, you've got to confront them to learn how to confront them. And so, you know, if, if a school says, well, gosh, we're never going to have one of, the, you know, one of these people around... Well, if, these, if, if, you're not, you, if you do not develop the skills to confront these people, respond to them, well, that's a skill that you're going to lose. Yeah, I mean, it's like a muscle. You've got you to gotta exercise it. This, is, this has happened in my life. This happened in my life a number of years ago. 
Um, gosh, it's, it's wild now. About, about 20 years ago, I was on a um, I was on a panel with Dinesh D'Souza, and uh, it was one of these. It was a debate, and it was a debate about affirmative action. Actually, it was at Georgetown University Law Center, and we debated. And actually, I did an abysmal job. <laughs> I did. I know I did. I did an abysmal job. A couple, about two weeks later, he was coming up to Harvard, and some group said, "You know, you want to, you know, you want to debate Dinesh D'Souza," and I said, "Oh yes, I really do," because I felt so badly about my performance the first time. The second, and I was, you know, I was really angry. I was shouting. I was, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was just, I was not your best self that day. <laughs> well, I was so angry that it was <laughs> as if. I didn't, you know, it was it was as if anger was going to do it. It was as if righteousness was going to win. The second time, time, you know, when it came around again, I was disciplined. I was calm. I, you know, I poked fun a little bit, and I was so much better. And it was funny because afterwards, you know, I was talking with him and, 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 he, and he knew it too. He knew it. And what it showed to me was, you know, debating is a skill. Mm-hmm. It's not as if, it's not as if righteousness is simply going to just jump out of your mouth. You've got to get used to talking. You've got to get used to, okay, they say this. Well, what is the response? <laughs> you know, I talk about this often. I mean, it, I don't know if you're on Facebook, but Facebook debates are pretty common. Uh, someone throws out a an argument and someone, you know, has this righteous response to it and then they engage in this debate and it happens to me sometimes and I don't have a great response to their response, so I spend the next hour researching, you know, the issue. And so when you hear these contrary points of view, it sends you back to the drawing table to investigate your beliefs and, and to, uh, maybe in some cases change them because you've been confronted with, with an idea that you hadn't considered before. And John Stuart Mill talks about this in On Liberty. He's, he writes, however unwilling a person who has a strong opinion may admit the possibility that his opinion might be false. He ought to be moved by the consideration that however true it may be, if it is not fully, frequently, and fearlessly discussed, it will be held as a dead dogma, not a living truth. Some of us, I'm sure, have this experience. Uh, how often are we having to argue with a Flat Earth Society member or argue with someone that gravity exists or that uh, you know X, Y, or Z that we hold as a dead dogma must exist? I, you know, I don't even know how I would go about arguing with a Flat, uh, flat Earth Society member or argue with someone that gravity is a real thing just because I never have to do it. If I had to do it, I, I would have awesome arguments for it. <laughs> Absolutely. And by the way, another thing is, you know, it's not as if, unfor- again, you know, I'm very disturbed by you know, ascendant, at least hopefully mom- just momentarily ascendant tendencies in our national life. But, you know, there are millions of people who actually believe some of the ideas that, you know, I find abhorrent. Well, okay. I find them abhorrent, but there are millions of people who believe them. Now, some of these people are going to be beyond convincing, right? Again, you know, mm-hmm. you're not going to. Some people are beyond convincing, but 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 there are some people in an appreciable number who are not. Again, how does one develop the facility to reach? such people. You cannot do it if you don't do it. Yep. And so, you know, frankly, in this time, I think, frankly, for, you know, there may have been a point not so long ago in which we thought that some of these ideas were so outré, so retrograde, that we really didn't have to debate them because, ah, nobody's going to believe that. Well, frankly, no. Actually, we've had a certain com- kind of comeuppance. No, people do believe it. So, how do we 
confront that? How can we persuade people to a different line of thought? Well, the way that you do that is to do it, and the best way to do it is to confront it, and the only way we're going to confront it is if, you know, we get down into the trenches, we get into the arena, and we test ourselves. And we, again, we develop a way of being so that we don't fall apart and, you know, start crying and, you know, just sort of, you know, go to pieces in the, in, in, in the face of opposition. You know, our ideological adversaries. We, again, it's tough. It is tough to change the world. But to, to change the world, we're going to have to be tough. And to be tough, we're going to have to, you know, confront our adversaries. Well, Professor Kennedy, I think that's a beautiful place to leave it. Uh, I'd encourage all of our listeners to check out your essay, The Forgotten Origin of the Constitution on Campus. Our executive director here at FIRE made it required reading for our entire staff. Uh, he sent out an email with a link to the article, and now it joins the ranks of uh, John Stuart Mill, Jonathan Rauch, John Milton's Areopagitica as a canonical free speech text here at FIRE. So I welcome you to those esteemed ranks, and I thank you again for talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. Well, listen, thank you very much for having me, and good luck with your all-important work. That was Harvard Law School professor Randall Kennedy. His article in the winter 2018 issue of the American Prospect is called The Forgotten Origins of the Constitution on Campus. And if you don't have a subscription to the American Prospect, it can be found online by searching for the title. Again, don't forget to also check out the new fire-supported podcast, Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech. The prologue is available today, and the first episode about ancient Athens and the trial of Socrates will be available next Thursday. If you subscribe on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts, you will not miss an episode. To learn more about the new podcast, you can visit freespeechhistory.com. This podcast is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash freespeechtalk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, as I say every week, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Reviews always help us attract new listeners to the show. I will see you all again. I guess I won't see you all again. I will talk to you all again in two weeks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.